sound of a ballet class. Well, it was here, on this spot, that the ballet, as we know it today, was reborn. Uh, here, on the stage of the Châtelet Theatre in Paris, on the 19th of May, 1909, uh, was the first performance of Diaghilev's Russian Ballet. And if the ballet, as an art form, is known and loved the world over, it is due to the energy, the foresight, the taste, the life's work, in fact, of one man, Sergei Pavlovich Diaghilev. <laughs> Diaghilev's Russian ballet lasted for 20 years, from 1909 to 1929. The Ballet Russe de Serge Diaghilev, to give it its official title, represented all that was newest and most exciting in the theater, music, and painting of that time. Well, I think that anybody who's fond of a theater or of music owes more than is possible to express to him. Bankowski has now become the pastime of tens of thousands of people in England and in the United States and everywhere else, and that is really entirely due to him. Had it not been for Diaghilev, the world would not have this vast wealth of art that it has today. That is quite sure. All our lives have been affected by the Diaghilev Company, whether we know it or not. He was a very shining example of a healthy breakaway, which shook Paris, uh, shook every country in Europe that had a sort of static establishment. He had this capacity to uh, stimulate the artists to give the best of themselves. For this reason, you see, all the artists to whom he has commissioned work, and not only in music, but also, uh, let's think only of Picasso, uh, Mersin, Lifar, Fokin, all these um, choreographers too, they have given their best works for him. Had he not existed, what would have happened to these people? History, of course, is very, uh, I would say, mischievous things, you see. I don't know how it will turn, but I do hope that it will be at all time recognized the Diaghilev era was the most brilliant era in ballet of all times. Although he was entirely Russian, uh, Diaghilev was no stranger to Paris. He'd been responsible for a Russian art exhibition and for a series of symphony concerts introducing some Russian music, much of it uh, which was entirely new to France, uh, and a, an opera season starring uh, Shalyapin. But uh, it was not until 1909, when he was 35 years old, that he first tried his hand at the, at the ballet. He attempted, of course, to get for this the Paris Opera House, but he failed. He had to settle for the Châtelet Theatre here, which is the traditional home of French operetta and musical comedy. In order to make it look grander, he eliminated six rows of stalls. He hung the theater with uh, watered silk. He filled the foyer with flowers. And according to the press, it was the, probably the most brilliant occasion, even of that particularly brilliant period here before the First World War. And no one who was here will, uh, will ever forget it. Uh, the first work was an 18th century fantasy called Le Pavillon d'Armide, uh, conceived and designed by my great-uncle, Alexandre Benoit, who at that time was Diaghilev's closest advisor. And its music by uh, Nikolai Cherepnin, uh, well, uh, here is some of it, recorded over 40 years ago by Sir Thomas Beecher.
this served to introduce uh, Pavlova, uh, Forkin, uh, the choreographer, and Nijinsky for the first time. And it was followed by the chorus uh, and uh, full court of ballet from the Imperial Theatre in St. Petersburg, the Mariinsky Theatre, in a performance of the Polovtsian dances from Borodin's Prince Igor. had seen nothing like it before. Stars were born overnight. Everyone talked of Pavlova, Nijinsky, and the young Karsavina. I remember next morning, I sat in my room, and there was an old friend with me. He came and he found me uh, darning uh, my stockings. He said, oh, you mustn't do that, you mustn't do that. I said, why not? But you are a celebrity now. And he brought me the papers, and I... For the first time, I learned there was La Karsavina. <laughs> well, Karsavina was to become the greatest of the Diaghilev ballerinas. And she's one of the many people that have come together in order to tell the story of this extraordinary epoch and uh, its animator. In fact, everybody who appears in these two programs either worked with Diaghilev or else bore testimony to these 20 years from uh, the auditorium. How do his colleagues remember him. Very good looking, perhaps in, uh, in a man of a lesser um, caliber, you know, in a lesser man, it would be called uh, too good looks. Uh, but he also had some peculiarities, you know, um, funny things about him, which in some other men might be considered false. For instance, you know, he walked with that sort of funny rolling gait and rolling his head from side to side. He reminded me very much of Strilheim. He was a very quiet man. People seemed to think that he was noisy and rampaged about. Well, he did not do that. He, he spoke very, very little. If he met you on the stage, he might just give you a little smile and pass by. He did not praise you and he did not criticize you. At the beginning, after having been rather impertinent on, at our first meeting, I became afterwards very humble with him because I admired him from day to day more and more because I realized the incredible courage he had and the incredible inspiration. He radiated it. I know if he came to see me at the shop, he would sometimes want things and um, ask me to look out for this or the other. That he, some document or something he needed and then he would just brush your arm with his hand which was rather plump and warm and nobody could be it was impossible to resist this caressing gesture on the other hand he could be quite different if he was annoyed about anything well I was really always too scared of him to really say that I have looked him straight in the face he was the most extraordinarily frightening man, at least to me. I don't think to everybody. There were members of the company who had no sense of fear of him at all, and I simply couldn't understand it. I think one of the only things we said against him was that he had rather snobbish side to his character, but in order to gain the sort of support which he had to have, it was absolutely necessary for him to recruit uh, rich people who were interested in that sort of thing. He, he couldn't stand anything that really wasn't absolutely first class. He liked to live in the best hotels, as he said, I have the best ballet in the world. I can take it anywhere that I want. And if I'm going to take it to the best opera houses, I'm also going to live in the very best hotel. What is the difference between Zagilev, for example, and a um, contemporary Messinus, as there are many who commission works, orchestra directors or orchestra societies or f uh, foundations or so on. They commission a composer and then there's a, the composer comes with his score and it is played and it is left for the, publics and the public and the critics to judge. Not so with Diaghilev. 
Zagreb wanted to see what he's buying, what he's getting, what he's producing. It was his, it was his property, and it was his, it was, then it sort of acquired his stamp. And once he gave his stamp, he was very, he wanted to be sure that this is what he approves of. The amazing success of the first season was in part due to the decadence of ballet in Western Europe. The great days of the romantic movement of Taglioni had given way to the grotesqueries of supposedly male dancers who were actually women in travesty and to fat ballerinas. Ballet, though popular, had no artistic value whatsoever. In Russia, on the other hand, the imperial theatres of St. Petersburg and Moscow had a great tradition and maintained the highest technical standard. Creatively, the atmosphere was stuffy, but they provided the raw material on which Diaghilev could draw. Ten years earlier, he himself had worked at the Mariinsky as special assistant to the director. He made a success of editing the annual report of the Imperial Theatre, but when it came to production, he was found too arrogant. He quarrelled with a prima ballerina, a great favourite with the Tsar, and eventually he was sacked. But he learned a great deal. He learned about organisation, and he started to form a policy of his own. What was that policy? Ballet is a part of a, a very complex spectacle, that is, for him it was poetry, um, uh, literature, painting, music, and choreography. And he, uh, without it, he never saw anything that would be uh, sort of uh, um, e expression of his ideas. These ideas were shared by Diaghilev's friend Benoit, a man of great culture, painter and designer, Nijinsky, Diaghilev's greatest friend who lived with him and was the most promising dancer in Russia, and most of all, perhaps, Fokin, who had choreographed the ballets seen on the first night. Fokin was to be responsible for all the ballets in the early days of the Diaghilev company. Though rooted in tradition, the originality of his choreography was tremendous, and it gained enormously from the setting that Diaghilev provided. He believed that every subject must have its own treatment and its own style, but they were all on the basis of the academic technique. Only well, he went further, you know, without breaking with it. One ballet above all others represents this novelty and its traditional origins, Les Sylphides, also given in that first season at the Châtelet when it was danced by Pavlova, Karsavina and Nijinsky. The key importance of Fokin's work lies in the extent to which action and drama are incorporated into the dance, replacing the old system of set dances separated by passages of mime. Typical of this was Scheherazade, produced the following year. Now, these photographs of Fokin himself and his wife in the principal roles show the strength and impact of his style, brilliantly married to Rimsky-Korsakov's famous music. <laughs>
almost impossible today to realize how different a ballet like Sherazade looked from the usual run of stage productions of that period. Not merely the dramatic content, but the contribution of the designer, in this case, Leon Buxt, another key figure in the history of the Diaghilev Ballet. Oh, it was at that moment when the scenery curtain went up and you saw the vivid reds and blues and greens, you know, the, the Buxt thing that came at you. I was accustomed to the sort of pastel colors of the musical comedy. I think they didn't go in for designers. They wrote at the bottom of the program uh, color schemes by Comelli, whoever he was, uh, but it was nearly always very, very vague and uh, indefinite. Suddenly you had this terrific impact of bright orange, bright emerald green, all the colors that you'd seen used sparingly, uh, filling a whole stage. Diaghilev and Buxt were old friends. Buxt had been one of the principal designers of the World of Art, a monthly magazine that Diaghilev had edited in Russia for nearly seven years. The World of Art, Mir Iskustva, was comparable in influence to the Yellow Book. It even featured Beardsley, but was wider in its interests. There were articles on Impressionism, on 18th century English painting, on Art Nouveau, architecture, interior design. It, it was a reaction against the academic atmosphere of the late 19th century. It taught Russians about what was happening in the arts abroad, and most of all, it revealed a whole new school of artistic thinking in Russia itself. It was Diaghilev's first great achievement. It gave Diaghilev also a familiarity with literature, with painting, that was to be another vital part of his knowledge and policy. The public success of Prince Igor or Sherazade was very much helped by the music, exotic, very Russian, and very unfamiliar at that time in Western Europe. Diaghilev himself came from an intensely musical background. His father, an army officer, venerated Glinka. His stepmother, who brought him up, was a fine singer. The Diaghilev family home in Perm, in eastern Russia, practically in the Urals, was the center of local cultural life. And among the musicians who visited them was the composer Mussorgsky. As a boy, Diaghilev had a passion for Tchaikovsky, and as a young man, after qualifying in law, he had tried his hand at writing music. He approached Rimsky Korsakov for lessons, but was turned down, and is reputed to have told Rimsky that history would show which one of them was to have the greater influence on the arts. By his second Paris season in 1910, Diaghilev had moved on from commissioning choreographers and designers to commissioning music and the composer on whom his choice fell for the fantastic Russian fairy tale, The Firebird, was the 27-year-old Igor Stravinsky. I loved the sound of it, you know, I was fascinated. But it was very difficult. And I never was one to count, because it reflected my attention, you know, I never counted the bars. And I said Stravinsky was very kind. He would come before the rehearsal and play the piano for me, you know, to explain me all the different parts. And then it became a great help for me. I learned to visualize the musical line. On and off, Stravinsky was to work for Diaghilev for the next 18 years and to produce his best known and possibly his best work for the ballet. 
Diaghilev's knowledge and judgment of music was invaluable. He would appreciate the most modern score, but also retained a profound respect for the past. This was also true both of painting and the ballet. In Russia, his greatest public success in 1905 had been an exhibition of historical portraits, over 2,000 of them, which he had assembled in St. Petersburg. It had taken three years of research and travel to organize, and it is still remembered today. Oh, it was wonderful. It was quite magical. You know, it was displayed um, in the great palace of Torida, you know, Tavrijevsky Dvorets, with magnificent rooms. It was in the evening, which gave it some kind of um, well, special um, enchantment, magic. In the second Paris season, Diaghilev also looked back to the great days of the past and revived the finest of 19th century ballets, Giselle. This masterpiece of the French Romantic school had been completely forgotten in the West, but was preserved intact in Russia. In it, Karsavina and Nijinsky showed audiences just how much had been lost. The strangest aspect of Diaghilev's career is that after 1909, he never again worked in Russia. He had, of course, quarreled with the imperial theatres. His ideas were thought so advanced as to be revolutionary, and his liaison with Nijinsky was becoming notorious. But the fact remains that all his important work in the theatre was done abroad, and the company, most of whom appeared for him while on leave from the imperial theatres, never performed as the Diaghilev Ballet in Russia. Like other Russians at that time, Nicholas Nabokov, composer and distant relative of Diaghilev, could only judge on hearsay. And hence there was around him an aura of mystery and of greatness which surrounded my childhood and the childhood of every thinking Russian. A kind of breakthrough from the usual rather uh, tawdry diet which the imperial theatres at that time served us. The turning point in Diaghilev's career came in the winter of 1910 with the dismissal of Nijinsky from the imperial theatres following an incident probably provoked by Diaghilev himself, which involved a supposedly indecent costume worn before a member of the imperial family. Nijinsky's dismissal and success abroad led Diaghilev and a group of friends and advisers who worked with him to think of establishing a company on a full-time basis. It was to become the first private touring ballet company in history. The key person in many ways was Nijinsky. Diaghilev had spotted him when he first made his debut in St. Petersburg. A shy, silent boy, his stage presence was something no one who ever saw him dance will forget. I think it was... Um primarily because he was a very great artist and every role that he created was quite different from the other ones. I mean, you see some dancers who have very considerable talents, technically, perhaps even medically, but on the other hand, one sees in some cases that it's the same dancer wearing a different costume. But with Nijinsky, that wasn't the case at all. I mean, he was a completely different person. Forkin was also persuaded by Diaghilev to sign a full-time contract. His talent as a choreographer was outstanding. His working method, straightforward and instinctive. As he danced in front, he would give a sort of running commentary on it. When he was uh, angry, he would say, it's uh, putrid. <laughs> 